Welcome to Materials World. First of all, congratulations to all those who have done really well in this exam. For those who missed it, can also escape 2024. You all can grab a scholarship up to 100% uh, by appearing on a scholarship test somewhere, uh, which is scheduled to be in my 2023 for any future announcement if you make. You can you can join our Telegram channel for, for any future update. Link is in the description, please join. So let's get started. So in this question number one, if you see, I mean, it is question number 44 for materials and it is question number one. If you see, uh, the question is, in age hardening of an aluminum alloy, the purpose of solution treatment followed by quenching is so. So it's asking what is the purpose? What is the purpose for doing quenching? What is the purpose of doing a solution treatment followed by quenching? So what is the purpose of doing quenching in our solution treatment? What is solution treatment? Solution treatment is, let's say, uh, let's say we have aluminum copper alloy. And let's say our aluminum copper alloy is somewhere 4% 4 4 copper in our aluminum. So we'll, we'll do our solution treatment. Okay, if you will do our solution treatment is we'll heat it up to a single phase reason that is alpha phase reason. Okay, and that is called solution treatment. After that, we what we do, we actually quench it. So it's asking what is the purpose of quenching that, that uh, quenching step. So if you see, if we do heat treatment, we heat it in this reason, one phase reason. We make our single phase homo homo homogenized phase of alpha in our L copper aluminum alloy. And uh, after that, we are quenching it. So we quenched it so that if you see here, the solubility curve here, the solubility curve is this one. So at at around 540 or 5, 550 uh, degrees Celsius temperature, if you see, uh, your 4% copper is also soluble in your aluminum matrix or host aluminum lattice. Now, the moment you quench it, what happens is your solubility, see, let's say your aluminum is here. So your solubility reduces. So your solubility, solvent line is here. So your, uh, your uh, solubility is almost uh, uh, close to zero. Like let's say 0.001% copper. Now it can only accommodate 0.001% copper in the aluminum matrix at this low temperature. So what will happen? That means it cannot accommodate even a single extra copper atom inside it. We call this solution at this stage, we call it as a super saturated solution because it is so saturated that it, can, it cannot even accommodate a single copper atom because of the, the lowest, because of the very low solubility limit of copper inside aluminum. So we super saturated. Why we do that super saturated solid solution? Because since your, your copper, this is 4% copper, 4% copper in our alloy. Now the 4% is cannot be accommodated at all at this temperature. It can accommodate up to very low. As you can see here, it is almost to zero. Okay, so what will happen? It will start rejecting copper. Okay, it will start rejecting copper from, uh, from aluminum matrix. Okay, so that copper, since it can, it, 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 it's, it, 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 it is no longer uh, the copper, extra copper, or extra copper that is there, okay, in alpha phase, will no longer be stable inside that phase because of its, at low temperature, its chemical activity will be so high that it will start separated, uh, start separating from alpha matrix, okay, and it will form another intermediate phase, okay, or precipitate. It will start forming precipitate from super uh, super saturated solid solution. So what is the purpose of doing quenching after solid solution treatment? Is forming super saturated solid solution so that we can we can precipitate we can allow precipitate to be precipitate out. Okay, because it is super saturated, the the element it will start coming outside out, out of the uh, phase alpha. And it will it will start making another phase theta. The the graph that we see, your your theta dash, theta double dash, and then the theta. And here is your G pigeon, which is which is the form of the, your super saturated. You'll fall first from G pigeon, then theta dash, theta double dash. These are the less stable, but theta is the more the more stable phase precipitate that you form in your uh, age hardened alloy, like aluminium alloy. Okay, so. So your answer is, answer is 
C. Okay. Answer is C. Now the next question: the magnetization, the magnetization, oh, magnetization and uh, magnetic field curve like MH curve. So normally, what we know is this is how the M will increase with increase in H. If you increase magnetic field strength, the magnetic dipoles will start aligning and uh, magnetization will increase. Okay. And if you remove the electric field, it will not follow the same curve. Instead, it will follow a hysteresis slope that we all know. And area under the curve is the hysteresis loss. Okay. Or the if bigger the area, okay, bigger the area, um, more difficult it is to demagnetize. Because when you are following this, you want to remove all the magnetization from it, right? So to remove that magnetization, let's say it is this curve is something like this. Okay, so you increased your you increase very small amount of uh, you increase very small amount of H and you get very high M. So magnetization is very easy. At the same point, if you decrease your H, it your magnetization becomes zero at very small change in H. So it can quickly magnetize and it, it can quickly demagnetize. Okay. Okay. Because the energy up, uh, energy loss is very low or this area is very low. These are the called soft magnetic material. But when we talk about permanent magnet, we want it to be, cannot it cannot be easily demagnetized. What does that mean? That means ki once you have given magnetizing inside it, you want a permanent magnet. Means the, um, uh, the orientation of magnetic dipoles to be permanent. You don't want demagnetized. You don't want to remove M from it. So if it is very, if this loop is very big, means the stress loss is very big. As you can see here, from let's say your magnetizing is here, okay, at this uh, H value. Now you, if you start decreasing H, your magnetization will start decrease. And you can see, the bigger the area is, more difficult it is to demagnetize because you have to travel this much distance or you have to reduce H not only up to zero, but also in a negative direction. Means you have to change the polarity also in north to south, south to uh, north. Okay. So it's very difficult, right? So demagnetizing is very difficult if hysteresis loss is very big. Or those those materials are called hard hard magnetic material. So for electrical steel, we don't want high electric loss. We want very soft magnetic materials like silicon, uh, element, uh, silicon steels. But for for getting permanent magnet, we want our we 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 want our uh, uh, this stress loss to be very big. Or in another way, we want we don't want this magnetization to be very easily possible demagnetization so that it can become permanent magnet. Okay. So, in another word, what you can say is the permanent magnet should have very large coercivity. Coercivity means this value. Okay. Very large coercivity and also very large retentivity. Okay. So that the hysteresis cycle of the material should be very tall and wide. So that you cannot easily demagnetize it. It can become permanent magnet. Okay. So answer is your correct answer is C because your retentivity and the coercivity is very high or the area is very high in this case. Okay. So your op option C is the correct answer. Okay. Now, if you see question number question 46. So the question is the band gap of, of a semiconducting material is two electron. So if you see, this is your, let's say conduction band, and this is your valence band. So the band gap is, the gap between it is how much? Almost two electron. Okay. So it's telling which one of the following absorption versus energy curve. So when it will absorb, when it will be opaque, when it will be uh, uh, transparent. So what is the condition? The condition is you have your electron in your valence band. You you put any energy source. We put laser or we put light or we increase temperature, whatever. We give energy to this electrons. This electron will have to be take that energy and excite. If this energy is greater than two electron volt or equal to two electron volt, what will happen? It will be able to jump, excite to conduction. Band. That means that energy is absorbed. If, if this energy is less than two electron volt, let's say one electron volt, 
then what will happen it it will go up to this this length only right this this axis is energy so it will go up to half distance only right and then it will come back right so in that case that will that will not be observed so it's very simple it will it absorption will start occurring if the energy is equal to or greater than 2 electron as simple as that okay if band gap is too big like let's say four electron but some some glass what will happen if you put electron like normal light normal light is 1.8 electron volt to 3.1 electron volt right that is nothing but 375 uh, 375 uh, nanometer to 700 nanometer almost okay this is the light its corresponding energy you can calculate at c by lambda or e in electron volt you can calculate 12400 by lambda in angstrom you can calculate okay so you can calculate its corresponding energy is 3.1 electron volt and its corresponding energy is 1.8 electron volt so what i mean is your light is having how much energy from 3.1 1.8 to 3.1 electron volt now if you are putting normal light that that glass which has electron four electron volt band gap that inner electron will not be able to jump and overcome this gap right because that h nu maximum h nu maximum energy is 3.1 electron volt and your gap is four electron volt it will not it will not be able to uh, 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 go in conduction band what does it mean it will come back and it will pass through it so your glass it will be transparent it will not be absorbed at all got the point so absorption will be zero if your band gap is greater than the energy given if your given energy is greater than if the given energy is greater than this gap then it will be absorbed okay so that is a basic idea about a transparency or a absorption and all okay similarly you can define for op op opacity also right if the if the if the if the band gap is greater than 3.1 electron volt then it will it will not be able to uh, absorb okay if the band gap is less than less than 1.8 electron volt what will happen then you are not uh, uh, you are not even supplying that much energy right so in short if you see here is our band gap okay easy and here is my energy that i am providing and this if it is light i am putting it light normal optical light or visible light the range is what 1.8 to 3.1 electron volt that is coming 1.8 is coming from around 700 nanometer right and similarly this uh, uh this uh, 3.1 is coming lower around 400 or 375 nanometer okay so energy that i am providing photon or light or thermal energy or whatever so optical light okay because i want to see whether my material is opaque or transparent or uh, let's say colorful so this is what the energy range i can give i can put x ray also i can put ir also i can put uv also but i am not talking about all energy range i am talking about uh, with respect to light how my material is looking whether it is opaque transparent or colorful so i can put light only right the the wavelength range is visible range that is fixed so my energy range is also fixed so if you see here if my band gap is what i can put minimum 1.8 electron volt i can give so if my band gap is less than 1.8 electron volt so if my band gap is less than 1.8 electron volt, like let's say it is let's say 1 electron volt then you can see here your 1.8 to 3.1 energy you can provide right a range of energy visible depending on the color of your light okay so you can you can apply so it, this energy that you are applying putting on the sample okay or a material is always higher than the band gap because your band gap is one electron volt so electron will be able to jump so it will be absorbed completely so it will be absorbed completely all the electron will go in higher energy state and it will it will be free in conduction band so all the electron will absorb all the energy so what were the light you are putting all energy all h new energy is absorbed by electron because they are able to jump the band gap because band gap is lower than 1.8 to uh, let's say 1.8 electron volt okay so your material become opaque and absorption will be 100% 100% absorption what about now if your band gap is if your band band gap is from 1.8 electron volt to let's 3.1 that is the normal uh, energy range that i can i can put from my light visible light if my band gap is this much then what will happen 
So see, let's say my band gap is 1.8 electron volt and I can provide minimum energy of 1.8 electron volt, right? So it will be observed. So let's say if my band gap is greater than 1.8 electron volt, like 1.9. So if my band gap is 1.9 electron volt, right? And I can put energy up 1.8 to 3.1, right? So as you can see here, energy which is equal to greater than 1.9, right? Will be absorbed because it will be sufficient for the electron to take that energy and overcome this gap. It will be able to jump because this distance required 1.9 electron volt and you are putting, let's leave this 1.8, 1.9 to 3.1. This will be sufficient to absorb, right? So as you can see, the, uh, the light which is having wavelength of 375, uh, sorry, 700 nanometer or which is having energy of 1.8 electron volt, it will not be able to absorb. But 1.9 to 3.1, it is higher than the band gap because my I'm assuming my band gap is greater than 1.8. Okay, so it will be able to observe. So fraction of fraction of fraction fraction of light fraction of light or wavelength. Okay, or energy fraction of light is observed. Observed means some portion some portion will not be observed. So so what is the depending on the gap the electron will not be able to observe it will come back. What electron? Exactly 1.8 electron volt in electron. It will if it, it will it will come back okay from 1.8 to here. So it will emit energy that will have wavelength energy of 1.8. Okay, which is the which is the light I'm putting. If it is 1.8, it will no longer be able to go in conduction mode because gap is 1.9. So it will come back, right? So if this 1.8 equivalent electron volt, it's equivalent wavelength, that equivalent wavelength light I will get. So that equivalent lambda, if it is let's say 375 nanometer, then I know my color will be violet. If it is let's say 700 nanometer, I, my color will be red. So my material will look what colorful. So fraction of light will be absorbed, but some light will not be absorbed. Let's say if it is 1.9, as I have demonstrated the gap, EG is greater than 1.8, right? So that means let's say 1.9. So 1.8 will not sufficient because my light has 1.8 electron volt also energy or some some wave which has having 1.8 electron volt. So they will come back, they will come back and they will come back means from high to low. So they will emit that much energy or photon. That photon will have how much wavelength equivalent to the 1.8. So it, it will show you color. So that material will be colorful. Okay. And if your band gap is even greater than 3.1 electron volt, as you can see here, your band gap is let's say 3.2 electron. Okay, then I am providing light which has energy capacity of 1.8 to 3.1 electron. So no light, no wavelength will be able to absorb because gap is so much. Right. So what will happen in that case? They will let's say I am putting let's say 3.1 electron. Right. So they will my wavelength is 3.1 or my uh, light is 3.1. So it will go up to, the gap is 3.2, it will go up to 3.1 and then it will come back. It is not observed because it, it is not reaching up to the condition. Mode. So it will come, the whole light will be, the whole 3.1 electron will be emit, 3.1 electron. So what does that mean? Hole is coming and hole is passing through it, just like glass. Glasses, glasses have band gap. Anything which is transparent, which they, they will have definitely band gap greater than 3.1 electron. Okay, so it will be transparent. You got my point? How energy and the band gap is related? How absorption and band gap is here? The absorption is 0%. Here, absorption is 0% absorption. 0% absorption. Okay. Trans your material is transparent. Why? When your band gap is greater than what? The energy that I can put. Okay. I can put what? I can put light, right? Light has a range of 1.8 to 3.1. If it is greater than 3.1, how it will be absorbed? Got my point? So note it down these things. They might be confusing, but if you, you do your reasoning, you'll be able to find it. Okay. Now let's solve the question. So question is, the band gap of semiconducting material is two electron. So the uh, 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 reason is simple. As you can see here, the band, band gap is two electron. Right? Now what is, what is the question? The question is, how absorption will vary with energy? Which energy? The energy that I am providing on the, I am, I am throwing on the sample. 
to check whether it is observing or trans, trans, uh, transparent or opaque. Got my point? This energy and x axis and absorption on y axis. It's telling, it's telling ki ener when energy is zero, there is 90% absorption. Means the light that I'm putting, even though it has zero energy, zero electron volt, it will absorb 90%. How is that possible? The gap is two electron volt. So your energy will be minimum two electron volt to be absorbed. Right? Your energy will be this energy will be minimum two electron to observe, start observing. Okay, got the point. So this is not answer. Here it's telling even if even at zero, it is 90% observing. That's also wrong. Here, even at zero, it's 10%. That's also wrong. Minimum two electron volt is required. Then only it will be able to overcome this gap, right? So minimum from two, the moment it will be two electron volt, the energy will be just, the electron will be just absorbed. The moment you increase the energy, as you can see, within the, if the energy is, the which energy? The photon that we are uh, focusing on the sample, okay? The incoming, which is uh, exciting the band, uh, balance band. If it is just greater than within fraction of increase in energy, okay, see the 90% so Of course, option D will be the answer. So your if band gap is two electrons, so energy minimum energy will be required is two electrons so that it will start absorbing. And within fraction of uh, energy increase, okay, 90% is absorbed. Got my point? So that is the basic idea. It is was it is very simplest question. Uh, it is the simplest question that you, one can uh, uh, frame if you know the concept okay, of, of a trans, a transparency, observance, or, or colorful nature of material. Okay, well, Let's go to the next question. So answer is D. Okay? Now here, this question is from GX curve. So this is a typical phase diagram that we have. Okay, And what, what is the GX curve? What is GX curve? What is the free energy of different phases like beta, liquid, or alpha? how they are changing with the respect to increase in concentration of second component, let's say P. Okay, so to, 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 so if you see here, if you, if you see here, see, it's telling, see, which, which phase will be stable in our alloy at particular temperature, which phase? That phase, if that phase has lower free energy than the other. For example, if free energy of alpha is lower than free energy of beta, then at that particular temperature, let's say there is a particular temperature T, at that point, only alpha phase will be there. Only alpha phase will be there in your alloy. Okay. If, if the free energy of liquid is lower than free energy of alpha, and also free energy of beta, also, of course, I can write, let's say. So in that case, only liquid, only liquid will be stable in our alloy. There will not be any. The moment the free energy of alpha will be become lower than free energy of liquid, you will start getting new nucleation of uh, new phases, which is alpha phase. But the point, so free energy should be lower, then only it will be stable. Got to at particular temperature. You understood? Now here, see, the free energy of alpha is, this is how it's changing with X. Or percentage of weight percent of B. Free energy of liquid is this is how it's changing, right? And free energy of beta is this is how it's changing. If you notice, up to this, from A to this much X uh, composition, only you see alpha phase. Why alpha phase? Because you see uh, the only alpha phase is existing. Why? Right? Because alpha phase, alpha phase, alpha phase is stable, alpha phase has lower free energy as compared to liquid and beta. Now, let's take the B, another extreme B towards B. See this curve, which is lower than, which is far lower, G value, G value, see, G value is lower than this two. So in this range, in this range, only beta will be stable. Now, the moment they will, the moment, of course, they will going to cross sect each other. So you have to draw the tangent of their lowest minima. Tangent of their lowest minima. The, this, this will tell you the 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 correspond the, the nearest phase plus nearest phase plus uh, the the another phase. Okay. And this will tell you the nearest phase plus another phase. And how it will be defined? It will be defined by in this range, as you can see here, in this range, which have the lowest free energy. 
So is as you can see here, two phases have lower free energy than uh, two phases have equal free energy than the other. So two phases are in equilibrium because their tangent are meeting here. The tangent are meeting here. So these phases, even if you, if you play the simple dice, then also you'll be figure figure it out. Now let's go to the temperature. A field diagram. Then you will see which phase is stable at what temperature, and it's asking this is for which temperature T1, T2, T3, T4. Okay, so let's go here. You see here, if you see this T1 temperature up to this is very small, this is very small composition window from, from 0% of B2, let's say 1%. What is what, what is this on this line? Alpha. So see, alpha. Then then you're in this range in at this temperature in this all composition range only liquid is stable is it only liquid is even here alpha and only liquid no it cannot be answered right if you see here t2 so up to some composition alpha is because it's passing through the alpha you see this reason is alpha reasons alpha is stable okay up to some composition alpha is stable then liquid plus alpha is stable at this time we will talk about this temperature at this temperature liquid plus alpha so yeah, liquid plus alpha uh, in this composition, it's existing. It's okay. Now see, you have in this only liquid is stable, but are you getting liquid here? No, it cannot be answered. Now let's go to the T4. So up to some, from zero to up to some composition, then only if this line is in alpha phase. So only alpha is existing. So see, in this range, alpha is stable. After that, in this composition range, at this temperature, in this composition range, Okay, alpha plus beta, but you get liquid. So definitely T4 is not answered, T2 is not answered, T1 is not answered. If you check the T3, see, up to this composition range, alpha is stable, up to this composition range, alpha is stable. Then up to this composition range, as you can see here, what is stable? Because it is touching, it is a tie line, it is touching liquid plus alpha, right? So liquid plus alpha is stable. Then up to this composition range, as you can see, Liquid plus beta is touching this line, so it, it is also there. And of course, alpha plus beta is also there. So you can see alpha liquid plus beta is also stable. Liquid plus beta is also stable. And further, this composition ring, this composition is only beta is stable because it has lower free energy. Only beta is stable in phase data. So which temperature is this? T3. Let's let's explain it in a simple isomorphous phase diagram because this can be a dicey because we, we will simply draw the tangent line and the, the nearest plus the third phase and the nearest plus third phase will be here. Okay. But you can understand, you can, you can correlate from this different, different temperature. Okay. At what, at what, I mean, if you, if you want me to draw at T1, what will be your GX curve? I can easily draw. This is your G, X of B, A and B. See, from this, very small uh, composition of B here because you, this line is passing through alpha region. And this is alpha region. Some alpha phase is there. So definitely your alpha will be lower at very small composition range. Okay. Okay. Now, as you can see here in this composition range, you, you see this liquid plus alpha is stable right as you can see your one will be like this right so as you can see here this liquid this is liquid okay and this liquid is stable up to some composition right? let's say here up to this much up to this much right and after that Oh, sorry, liquid plus alpha is stable. So alpha will be also here. So if you draw all the tangent, this tangent, this tangent, and this tangent, okay, somewhere, some like something like this. So you can simply say, see, here liquid is stable in this range. This is liquid curve. Okay. This is liquid curve. Okay. So in this range, liquid is stable. So only liquid will be there in phase. And in this range, what is stable? In this range, what is stable? Only alpha is stable. So this is a curve for alpha. And in between, you have a liquid, uh, you have a beta phase. 
okay so beta phase is no longer nowhere nowhere in the system okay let me let, let me i mean let's make it a little bit easier by taking simpler uh, phase diagram if it is eutectic phase diagram it will be complex but think you can easily understand by by understanding the uh, at different different temperature what is the what is the stable composition okay let me give you some simpler example for example let's say let me give you uh, let me give you uh, uh, isomorphic set diagram so see it's very easy because it's two phase now so it's very easy this is liquid this is alpha and this is liquid plus alpha okay simple you take different different temperature at this temperature only only this is let's say t1 let take this temperature this is t2 which is exactly equals to melting temperature of d right and this you can take you can take one temperature which is passing through two phase region let's say this is t3 okay and you can take one temperature which is exactly touching this point which is melting point of a let's say t4 which is melting point of a a right and this is percentage of b now it's very easy to draw the phase diagram because you have only alpha liquid and alpha two phase okay so you have a see let's talk about at temperature t1 at this temperature only liquid is stable everywhere liquid is there na so your liquid will have phase diagram a g curve lower everywhere than the solid so this is this is g of liquid and this is g of alpha so everywhere from 0% 0% b 0% b to 100% b everywhere liquid has lower free energy than the solid so that is why your your liquid is only liquid is stable that's what the this graph is showing right now let's this is at t1 at, at t2 at t2 at t2 let's say temperature equals to t2 what will what will be there so you can see here at t2 which is temperature melting point of b okay you see only here your liquid and your alpha are in equilibrium at melting temperature of b right at 100% b otherwise this line is only in liquid phase so what are you telling here only here two phase are in equilibrium so free energy is equal so only at this point only at this point the free energy of alpha and free energy of liquid are equal other than everywhere only at 100% b equal so though your liquid and alpha will be in equilibria everywhere in all composition range in all composition range you see in all composition range your liquid is free energy liquid is lower than solid right so you see in all composition range in all composition range, only liquid is stable but only at this point we are getting free it's very easy to follow in two phase reason because you don't need to take the uh, tangent of minima okay let's take the t3 which is passing through two phase reason two phase reason liquid plus alpha it's very easy it's not problem it see this is the composition range where only only your liquid is stable and this is the this range this is the composition range where only alpha is stable right so your phase diagram will be something like this they will cross actually something like this depending on the temperature as you can see here this so you can you can draw the oh let me draw let me write little oh something like this so as you can see here you can take the their tangent their tangent so in this range before tangent see only in this range what is there see what is there at t3 we are talking about only only liquid is stable right this is liquid range so in this range so this will be free energy of liquid right and this is free energy of solid as you can see in this range everywhere your free energy of liquid is stable and uh, beyond this tangent in this range 
okay or in this range only see this this is only alpha so only alpha is stable that means see z alpha this line is lower lower than the liquid one right so free energy of alpha is lower than liquid so only alpha will be stable here only liquid will be stable and in between them in this range both alpha plus here we are talking about this range okay both liquid and plus alpha will be stable in this range right be, be, between the tangent liquid plus alpha so see and also in in at this temperature let's say at this temperature only it is in solid range that means your sol free energy of solid will be everywhere lower than the this is free energy of solid and this is free energy of liquid everywhere it will be it will be lower throughout the whole so only alpha alpha is lower in all composition so only alpha will be stable in any temperature a, at any temperature which is in alpha range got my point so whenever free energy is lower okay that will be stable so this is how phase diagram is plotted from the uh, gs curve so you can apply the same logic here also okay it's it's not very uh, detailed by 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 actually tra tracing uh because you, you need alpha at some composition then liquid plus alpha then liquid plus beta then beta where you are getting alpha alpha plus beta this cannot be alpha liquid plus alpha then liquid plus beta then beta alpha liquid plus alpha limit so this will be the temperature so if we go to t2 alpha then liquid plus alpha alpha liquid plus alpha then you have only liquid there is no other phase here you have liquid plus beta not only liquid right so this cannot be so it's very easy if you really understand the concept behind it okay now this is question which is really really interesting okay so it is well taught in our regular course i i i hope my students did remember this notation it's very easy to remember the notation uh, uh, we 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 call it something like uh, kroger wink notation so what is that notation tells that tells the defect reaction like if i am if i am uh, if i am mixing two ceramics ionic ionic compounds or two ceramics okay uh, at different stoichiometry or at certain stoichiometry how the cation will replace the cation in a host of uh, anions like for example uh, your N nacl is the host nacl 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 right and then you have cl na cl na c so this is typical na cl na cl this is a lattice okay cl na cl na cl your cation will be little smaller than the anion that's that's well known now if you are if you are mix, mixing two ceramics so if they are they are uh, they don't have same valency we call it alveolar doping like if you are mixing mgcl2 in your nacl so definitely your na is having only one valence na plus and mg is having mg2 plus so it's a alveolar doping so what will happen to to balance the charge okay defects will be created to neutralize the charge because no lattice is stable at in charged state so it has to remove the extra charge by creating vacancy or interstitials or defects okay so so if you see this cl this cl will simply go this cl okay this cl will simply go and sit on the uh, uh, side of cl it's very easy cl will replace cl right so cl will replace cl cl will replace cl cl will replace cl it's well known now if this mg is going to replace na so what will happen first you have to create the na vacancy so you remove na so so you plus one charge you removed so at this side it will be minus one for example if your hole is removed from here to here if electron is removed from here to here then you created a so minus one charge you removed so you created plus one charge that is hole you create a hole right so like the plus two charge if you removed okay then you created a minus two charge at the side exactly opposite and equal charge right it's very easy right like if let's say you have n n has one electron you remove minus one that is one electron so it will have exactly plus one charge at the side opposite charge right so if you remove this n from here plus one charge so you created minus one charge in the lattice right now if you are replacing this mg so you are adding plus two charge if you are adding plus two charge 
so you are creating net plus one charge on the lattice by substituting na with mg so you are so this lower side is telling you the the host site on which your external or foreign atom will go and sit so that is what is going to be substituted so your cl is substituted by cl that's okay your na is going to be substituted by mg so this is lower side is the host metal or host site and mg is the foreign which is going to substitute na so your na is substituted by mg but na is going to substitute by mg but what is the net charge you created on that side plus 1 now you see this notation is actually the charge notation dot is denoted by plus 1 charge and this is denoted by one electron charge or minus one charge if you don't remember this you you can you will not be able to differentiate this two right so by replacing this na i by substituting mg2 plus i have plus one charge so i know i know only this this replacement will give you this dot dot notation means plus one charge and this prime notation means minus one charge got the point now what is the another another thing is the moment you created plus one charge this system wants to neutralize the charge how it will neutralize how it will neutralize so this plus one charge you have two ways one way is you add minus one charge in the system right how can you add this cl you can push it in the interstitial site you can see how big the cl is this much big you want to put you want to put in the site you can add cl in the interstitial then you are adding minus one charge you are adding uh, plus one you already had you added minus one charge and you got neutral another way is see you have a plus one charge you remove plus one charge from the system you remove this small n n a from the system right it will be neutral right you have a plus one charge you remove that charge from the system you will get neutral so removing means creating vacancy so which one is more favorable creating vacancy of n a or creating cl interstitial creating cl interstitial will create a lot of distortion because its size is very big but creating vacancy is very easy in this case at least right so you will create you will create an a vacancy see and at the site of an a you will create a vacancy and that vacancy will have minus 1 charge so you had plus 1 charge already you neutralize it with minus 1 charge and you got a zero you got the point the defect reaction is exactly notation of what happens Uh, how much uh, substitution is there at what site and what is the charge on that site and to neutralize that site how many vacancy or interstitial is created got the point okay now so this this is given by uh, uh, um kroger wink notation so the kroger wink notation says you see this is something this is something uh, that you have to understand okay this is the symbol for the defect atom okay this b is the site the site in the crystal and the, this will tell you charge plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus uh, plus 4 or minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 remember the minus 1 minus 2 minus 3 is given with prime 1 minus 1 is this minus 2 is this minus 3 is this dot is denoted by positive charge like uh, uh, only one plus charge this two plus charge this one three plus charge this one okay and this will tell you the site and this will tell you the, what is the vacancy type symbol for defect atom if it is vacancy we denote it by v right if if the atom which is uh, which is substituting another site so that atom will be here so you can you can write in this form also your m is the atom type okay which is going to be substituted l is the lattice site in the original perfect lattice and this c denotes the charge effective charge and 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 it could be dot or it could be prime so this is the typical notation okay you can write for any uh, two defect reaction so definitely now if if you simple have idea this is minus one charge this is plus one charge if you substitute so you have an na cl na cl you are putting mg 2 plus and cl minus right the cl will substitute this so cl will substitute cl this is this is all three can be answer now your mg is going to substitute na so at the at, this is the lattice site in all case mg is substituting na but what is the, there is no there is no uh, charge at all there is net minus one charge 
there is a uh, plus one charge on the side on this na side let's see so to uh, substitute mg you remove this mg M na plus first you create vacancy then only it will sit now so the moment you remove plus one you created minus one here at the side now you're adding plus two charge you're adding plus two charge you're getting plus one net plus one means so definitely this is not answer this is not answer this is answer and if you go in one step further this can be also asking gate like what is the favorable defect that's a vacancy or interstitial whatever if you go in one step now your lattice is having plus one net charge so how you can how you can neutralize it by removing plus one charge so creating vacancy of na vacancy of na and another one is by simply adding one minus one charge to the system by adding CL to the interstitial. Adding CL to the interstitial is very difficult because it will create a lot of distortion because CL is big, but the creating vacancy of NA is easy. So vacancy of NA is something created because that if the moment you create vacancy of NA, you remove plus one charge, so you get minus one charge on the set, right? So that is what the minus one denotes here. Vacancy with minus one charge, right? It's very easy, easy piece if you remember that notation. But if you don't remember this is positive and this is negative, then you will fall in track because that is the trick here. The next question, a screw dislocation in FCC crystal has a buzzer vector of this, uh, where A is the lattice constant, the possible slip plane. So again, I'm telling you, if you, if, uh, if you have come here to only see the answer, okay? So just fast forward it, okay? So for this answer is B, uh, for this answer is C and B. So you can just see and uh, uh, skip the video. But if you're here, for uh, uh, knowing their concept. Okay, so let's discuss concept. So it is also answer key as well as detail explanation. So you can skip, okay, you can skip forward and uh, you can see the answer, okay. So here, so uh, so a screw dislocation of FCC has buzzer vector this. What is the possible sleep plane? So if you see screw dislocation or edge dislocation doesn't matter. Your, your, if your, your buzzer, your uh, dislocation is going to lie on the plane it can lie on this way also it can lie it can lie on this way also right so this component this component uh this component is as you can see this is age this component is exactly in this direction so this component is pure age okay and 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 i can also write i can also write this could be screw dislocation screw dislocation so this component is pure screw this component is pure screw, where this direction is the, the dislocation line. Here, this direction is dislocation line. You got my point? But both will stay on the slip plane. So let's say this is my slip plane. So this is, this will be my age dislocation. And this will be my slip dislocation. If this is my, uh, not slip, screw dislocation. If this is age, then this is going to be dislocation line, right? Dislocation line. And buzzer vector will be in this direction because this dislocation, age dislocation will move in this direction. If you apply the tau in this direction, they will move. As you can see, dislocation is moving. Okay, this is buzzer vector. This direction is buzzer vector, right? So if you apply stress, okay, you see the slip is in this direction. That's why it is moving towards buzzer vector. And your dislocation line, as you can see here, you can clearly see here, your dislocation line is exactly perpendicular to because your buzzer vector is this direction the buzzer. so this is age component for pure screw for pure, pure screw this is your dislocation line and your buzzer vector is what this one your buzzer vector will never change okay it will be same in, in both age and all component throughout all dislocation line buzzer vector is same for example if i'm writing this is a dislocation loop if i'm writing buzzer vector is this buzzer vector tells you the direction of sleep so if I'm defining my material is sleeping in this direction, so that is the buzzer vector direction. Now, definitely this is going to be dislocation line and this is going to be dislocation line, right? These two extreme I'm talking about. So this is definitely a par, uh, screw dislocation because your dislocation line is parallel to buzzer vector. And here, your dislocation line is perpendicular to buzzer vector. So it's a age. So these two extreme are age component, these two extreme are uh, screw component, and this is mixed one. These are the mixed one. What my point? So I'm talking about two extreme to extreme, okay? So uh, what I'm trying to prove here is my dislocation will lie on the slip plane. Even though it is mixed, it is pure screw or pure uh, 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 edge. 
Got my point? So let's say this is my sleep plane. Okay, how it will lie? So if you see the 2D plane structure, okay, here. So this is extra half plane. So here, here I have a dislocation. So what is sleep plane? You see the half plane, it has extra edge and that edge is the edge dislocation where this vector is dislocation line vector T. So you see, this is the sleep plane. Okay, I, I, okay, see here, it doesn't mean that these are not the plane, these are also plane, okay. So see, this is the plane where dislocation will move. This is the plane where my dislocation will move. Okay, got the point, which plane I'm talking about. Now, if you see, my dislocation is, my dislocation is lying on the sleep plane. This is my sleep plane, right? Let's say it is HKL, right? So if it is cubic system, then a plane, and if it is normal, if you plot normal to the plane, both will have the same uh, uh, indices. This is normal vector of perpendicular direction. And this is, for example, if you see the cubic, if you see cubic, you can verify using cubic. See here, what is, what is this direction? It's a 100. Zero zero. And what is this plane? It is also 100. Zero zero. Only difference is this will be in a round bracket and this will be in a square bracket. But in Texas is same. See, if you, if you draw a plane, okay, it's normal will be exactly have the same indices. This will be 100 zero zero only. If you know this plane is 100. Zero zero. If you know this plane is HKL, then anything which is perpendicular to this plane will be also HKL. But it will be vector. So if it is HKL, this will be also HKL, perpendicular to that plane. Is, is it clear? Now let's go back. Why I, will need, I need this vector? Because I know this is my Berger vector, right? Right. And also, if you see, your, 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 this is your uh, uh, dislocation, right? And the same is your Berger vector. Got my point? Because this location line and budget beta both are parallel in screw, right? And what is my plane? What is my plane? My plane is something that I am searching for. My plane is, let's say, HKL, right? Now see, this, this budget vector, I know the vector, A by 2, 1, 1, 0. So it, the, the, by magnitude A by 2, but the vector is 1, 1, 0. If my direction is lying or a vector is lying on any plane, their dot product is 0. Why? Because this plane, in cubic I'm talking about, this plane has exactly the same vector which is perpendicular to this Berger vector. Got my point? If it is perpendicular, so one vector, uh, let's say uh, this, ve uh, this vector, uh, one vector, one vector is this, right? And one vector is this. And both is perpendicular. Both is perpendicular. That means their dot product will be zero. That means if you do dot product with any of the plane, you should get the zero. If you get zero, that will be your sleep plane. It's very simple, right? So go ahead. Your one into one, one plus one into minus one into one, one plus zero into minus one, zero. It will never give you zero. If dot product is not zero, this cannot be sleep plane, right? Here, if one into one, one, one into one, one, and zero into one, plus zero, it will never give you zero. This, is, this cannot be answer, right? If you give one into minus one, minus one plus one into one, one plus zero into one, zero. As you can see, this is giving you zero. And also, and also if you see one into one, one, then one into minus one, minus one, then zero into one, zero. This will also give you zero. Then this is the answer, right? This is C and D is our answer. Okay. So logic is simple. If the Berger vector or dislocation line, it's lying on the plane, then the dead dot product will be zero. This is the plane. This is the Berger vector. Even dislocation line is given, then also you can do the same thing. Okay. This question is, uh, let's go to the next question. This question is, if you see, uh, it's, 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 it's very tricky, but it requires only small memory. If you can remember 
if you remember this work hardening rate, what is this called? Okay, you can you can solve this within fraction of second. And I have already I did explain to my regular batches. So if you remember, if you remember this uh, fr from the notes, your d sigma by d epsilon is n sigma by epsilon. The d sigma by d epsilon is called rate of strain hardening, or it is called work hardening rate. And if you see the question, if you see the question, if you see the question, it is telling at maximum load. At maximum load means after that, you'll get the Nikkei. That means this is the onset of Nikkei. Onset of Nikkei, right? And if you see the, for at exactly onset of Nikkei, your N is exactly equals to twist. This is called considered criterion, and that I will explain how it, it comes. I will I will show you the derivation. Right? N equals to epsilon. Got my point. So, so it's telling you calculate d sigma by d epsilon if at maximum load means when n equals to epsilon. If you see the notes, if you see the formula also, you can see here at maximum load your epsilon will become n. It is cancelled out. So d sigma by d epsilon is nothing but sigma, simple. That means telling calculate the work hardening rate, means calculate the true stress at maximum load. It is so easy, like you can easily calculate, if you remember this is small uh, logic of considered criterion, right? So you see here, so here it's telling calculate the work hardening rate, that means calculate sigma. At maximum load, that means when epsilon is n, so simple. Here is the expression: sigma you want to calculate and 500, and your epsilon is exactly n at maximum load. That means your n is 0.15. So your epsilon is also 0.15. Then put here 0.15 epsilon to the power 0.15. Solve. That is your answer. See, if you remember what is work hardening rate, your work hardening rate is your your work hardening rate is simply sigma at maximum load. This we can show using consider criteria. Okay. So what does this consider criterion says? What is work hardening? It means the way you are increasing the stress with strain. Because with increase in strain, you are creating dislocation. So you are creating dislocation, you are increasing its uh, hardness, you are increasing its hardness as well as you're increasing its uh, strength. That's why strain hardening we call it, or strain hardening uh, the slope d, uh, d sigma by d epsilon is called rate strain hardening rate or work hardening rate okay so 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 you can you can derive this consider a criterion you can you can simply write you can you can see at at cross sectional area of the specimen at any instant let's say it is a then you can write sigma equals to f by a or p by a it's the same thing right and also the rate of increase of load is df by d epsilon what is that you can put put p equals to sigma a and then you can differentiate it yeah, first into difference of second and second into difference of first and we also know the volume is constant up to maximum load. So you can write dv by d epsilon. What is v? V is for area into length is zero. Because your volume is constant, so change in volume is zero. A dv by d epsilon is zero. Okay. So you, from here you can get this. And what is this strain? Strain is real by L. Similarly, what is da by da by epsilon? So what is the what is da by epsilon? So it's nothing but your your a by L into dl by d epsilon. I mean, you can put here. Uh, I mean, you can take here this help. Here. Okay. From this equation, you can approach this d d by d epsilon. You can get minus a. Right. So your final expression, if you put here, this and this, so you'll get this expression. And now, if you if you if you now if you see the force, uh, the the d by d epsilon. What does that mean? The load versus epsilon so the slope the slope is uh, the slope is zero at maximum load at maximum load slope is zero so at at p equals to p max maximum load or maximum stress okay your slope is zero right at maximum the first differential will be zero okay or the slope is zero so that means this this much equals to you can put equals to zero and then you can get this equals to zero, this equals to zero, and then you can get this one, right? 
and from here you can simply see you got this expression that is what is required in that question d sigma by d epsilon and sigma it's a simple expression now we all know sigma equals to k epsilon to the power n you can put here that and you you can simply so you so you can differentiate is d sigma by d epsilon equals to what n k epsilon to the power n minus 1 and what is d sigma by d epsilon sigma sigma equals to n k epsilon to the power n minus 1 right and if you if you simply solve it if you simply uh, and see what is sigma sigma is k epsilon to the power n equals to n k epsilon to the power n minus 1. k is cancelled out and if you see n is nothing but epsilon so this is considered a criterion that work hardening rate becomes exactly equal to stress true stress at a maximum load so at at maximum load your work hardening rate exactly means slope becomes exactly equal to the true stress so that means if you increase the if you increase the uh, strain further your work hardening rate will not increase it is telling you sigma okay it will increase and it will always increase in true stress strain curve if you see true strain curve will never have a maximum it will keep increasing but in this case curve why it's decreasing because the increase in sigma because you are you are increasing epsilon so your work hardening rate is increasing in sigma is increasing that increase in sigma is balanced by decrease in area because of the netting and that's why we are getting down here okay but in true it will keep increasing so this is the basic thing just remember okay just remember this expression and you can as as we saw we can easily solve this okay so what is the answer for this question answer is 3, 376 and uh, simple small memory can help you solve this what is this question this question is just calculation a metal has a certain vacancy fraction at this vacancy fraction is nv by n what is that e to power minus q by rt or kt so the r is in mole and q is also in mole so q by rt is okay so this is already certain we don't know it is given at what temperature at t1 equals to 600 kelvin now it's telling increasing the temperature to 900 so if t2 becomes 900 then what is my the vacancy fraction increases by a factor of what so let's say this is 1 and this is t1 so at t2 i have a vacancy fraction of nv2 by nv1 that is e to minus q by r t2 so this is increased by how many times that means this divided by this it's asking nv2 by n how many times it is increased by initial one how many times it is increased by initial one that k let's say k into so your nv2 by n equals to k into nv1 by n so how many times this nv2 is increased to the previous one k how to get k by nv2 by nv1 by n right so this is nothing but nv2 by nv1 you want to calculate right this n is considered out. you want to calculate it's very simple your nv2 by nv1 is e to the power minus q by r it is starting with the 2 so 1 by t2 minus 1 by t Two to one, so two to one. Right? It's a simple. I mean, you can write individual expression also, and then you can divide. You can get the same expression. Okay, it's very simple. If you t two is given, t one is given, q is given, r is given, you can calculate this. N v two by n v one, and that will that will give you that will give you answer of so ninety four point three. Okay, don't forget uh, to use multiply by thousand because it is kilo. It's very simple in this question. in a semiconductor the ratio of ele electronic mobility to hole mobility is 10 electronic mobility to hole that means mu e by mu h is given by 10 the the density of electrons and holes are this so density of electron number of electron okay per per unit value 10 to 15 meter cube and density of hole that means number of hole per per meter cube that is 10 to 16 Okay. then if the conductivity sigma is also given 1.6 ohm inverse meter inverse then the mobility of hole is what is mu h so so it's very simple calculation actually it has no logic at all because you know sigma equals to any mu that is electron any mu e n plus what n h e mu h right so so you have a uh, you can you can simply substitute Right, any, 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 any 
n is already given right 10 for 50 10 for 50 into e what is mu e mu you can substitute in terms of mu h because you want to calculate mu h you can re replace this mu e so 10 mu h and plus number of fold number of fold is 10 per 16 into e e into uh, mu h right is 1.6 as you can see here 10 per 15 into 10 10 per 60 10 per 16 mu h e right and plus 10 per 16 mu h e one 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 mango plus another one mango you'll get a two mango right it's a two into 10 power 16 mu h e right? equals to 1.6 so what is your mu h mu h is 1.6 by 2 into 10 power 16 into e e is 1.6 into 10 power minus 90 as you can see 1.6 1.6 is cancelled out it is actually 1.2 into 16 and 16 and minus 90 it will give you minus 3 it will go up and it will make 10 power 3 right so it's a 0.5 into 10 power 3 so as you can see here you can get your answer it will be 500 right so your answer is 500 okay